Hello, everybody. Uh, not a joke. I was, on, I was a rock and roll drummer for five or six years after college. Left the band, moved to Seattle, couldn't get a job, had to lie to get a waiter job. Uh, ended up uh, going to law school. And um, I tell young people who want to get serious about their career in their 20s that I was basically unemployed until I was 33, and I was in the White House when I was 40, so take your time. Um, now, uh, I, this is a problem I have. I, I'm constantly speaking to groups that are smarter than me about what they're doing. And one time I was at a meeting, scientific meeting, lots of smart people. And the person introducing me said, you know, we've had a whole morning of these really uh, erudite, complicated presentations from these really smart people. And now for something completely different. Uh, and that was, that was my cue. Um, my son, uh, I am not a computer person. I'm not a coder. My son is. He was at Microsoft five years in Washington, D.C., and now he runs a, a bunch of coders working on specialized software for the rare disease program at NIH. So when I say fire, he says HL7. Uh, the rest of the family says 911. Uh, and my daughter's dating a Homeland Security guy who's a weapons expert, so when he's over, we don't even say fire. We don't, <laughs> no fire. Um, so uh, the, um, I, I want to pose a question. Um, how fast is the internet? I don't mean your download speed. I mean, how fast is the internet from getting a bit from point A to point B? Can we agree it's faster than the mailman and slightly less than the speed of light, okay? But let's say it's much closer to the speed of light. It took our system four days after the system knew to tell me that I had leukemia. And I had flown across the country in that time, which could have been deadly depending on the leukemia. And I only found out because I asked my doctor what, for the results of my physical. And he said, oh, I'm glad you called. <laughs> wow. He said, your PSA is good. I'd had some prostate biopsies and your cholesterol is better. But by the way, you have leukemia. Now, I went to public school in Arkansas, but even there, we don't use by the way like that. We say, by the way, you've got tissue paper stuck on your shoe, <laughs> not you have leukemia. So I said, what do you mean? He says, you have 160,000 white cells. So I had just landed in San Francisco. I was still on the plane getting my bag down. I called because he would be closed within a half an hour, and I know he didn't work on Fridays. So I'm thinking to myself, why did it, now that I know, because I had years of blood testing and I've already had my chemo and I'm doing very well, I now know that it takes 15 minutes to count the white cells in a blood test. I go into my doctor's office, they take my blood, and 20 minutes later I'm talking to him with the results. It took him four days to tell me, and that was only because I called. So when I say that we've got an urgent problem to do what you do to get our data out, that's why I say it. It's not hypothetical. It's not just policy. I fortunately had a leukemia that was treatable. I had a friend who went on vacation from here. My last day in Seattle, I had a big goodbye party. I introduced a friend of mine to a, another friend of mine. They got married. They went to Hawaii on vacation. He was sick when they left. He didn't know it. He died in Hawaii three days later of acute leukemia. So we have a big problem. And that problem is how do we get the information out? Do any, have you any, any of you ever read the novel trilogy starting with Wool? Have you ever heard of Wool? Raise your hands. Wool is a fantastic trilogy of a post-apocalyptic world in which people are literally living in silos that go hundreds of floors into the earth that were built to hold these people because the people who designed the silos were going to cause the nuclear war and they wanted only the best to survive. And these people, 100 years, 200 years later, think that God created the silo for them to live in and that the outside world is a poisonous, awful environment. And I'm not just talking about epic. <clears throat> People think that these data silos came from heaven. As my friend Laura Esserman, breast cancer surgeon in San Francisco says, how is it possible that Moses could download information from a cloud onto a tablet and we can't? <laughs> so the other thing I want to say is how many of you watch Game of Thrones? 
okay? Do you remember, this is a really dangerous time right now, and I say that because we've been fighting this fight 20 years, and now people are starting to agree with you that we should do all this stuff and open up the world. So when people start agreeing with you, things get really dangerous. What do I mean? Well, do you remember in, Ga in Game of Thrones when the mountain was fighting the guy with the sand snakes and, he, and the sand snakes guy has knocked the mountain out and he's, we think he's dead and the guy's gloating because he thinks he's won and then the mountain grabs him and squishes his eyes out? That's where we are. <laughs> it's just like Lord of the Rings when Gandalf has defeated the Balrock and he's standing on the bridge and at the very end the Balrock grabs him and takes him down into the abyss. That's where we are because people are starting to agree with you and they keep saying, well, we like what you're doing. It'll take two years. It'll take five years. It'll take 10 years. No, <laughs> it needs to happen now. And I'll come back to that. So I have the burden of being a history major and I studied a lot of theories about information because it's kind of critical to history. And in order to go from information to wisdom, you all know this information data has to first become information because data is not information until you put it into context. So if I say 107 to 106, most of you might know that that's the score of the basketball tournament last night when the Golden State Warriors beat Toronto 107 to 106. You probably didn't think it was the weather. And if I said four to three, you wouldn't think that that's time because we don't usually talk about time backwards. So context matters. The problem in health is that our data is captured in such small contexts that it's really hard to turn it into information because it's institution by institution. And that is not a big enough context. The same thing when we're trying to go from information to knowledge, which means you can use the information to actually do something. If we have all the information captured in one practice here and one practice there and one hospital there and one cancer center there, we never get them together enough to know whether the information is really knowledge or if it's an artifact of something else or it's a random event. And we can't go from knowledge to wisdom, which is the ability to predict what's going to happen until we have a big enough context for the information to really flow all the way through to people who are the doctors and the researchers who are trying to predict what causes cancer in this situation or that situation in this person and that person. So until we solve this problem of putting it all together, we can't get to what I call human informatics. We've got bioinformatics, clinical informatics, genomic informatics, all, you know, far more than I do. But the bottom line is it has to be put back together into human informatics so we can predict the onset of disease and we know how to treat it because we know what happened yesterday in every cancer center in the country. And you think, oh my God, how can we know everything that happened yesterday in every cancer center in the country? Well, every day, every 15 seconds, we know every financial transaction in the world. In the world. But your money doesn't get cancer. You get cancer. So why are we tracking our money every 15 seconds and the cancer data that we use is five years old all the time? It has a five-year tail on the cancer dog. So it is a huge problem that we have divided the world into something that's just oh so hard tracking what happens every day in health. But in money, they have figured out for a long, long time how to track far more transactions and far more complicated transactions all over the world, all the time, you can do it all day long. Now, what is the Biden Cancer Initiative doing about all this? And I'm talking fast because I only have 20 minutes and I'm happy to talk fast because I'm from Arkansas and it's counterintuitive. <laughs> um, as I tried to explain to my mother, mom, we're trying to get people to share data. What do you mean, son? Don't they do that now? No. And we're trying to get them to have the same standards for pathology. So when you go to one place and you go to another place, they don't have to do the biopsy over or they don't have to call the doctor and have them explain it. You mean they don't do that now? Now, this is hard to explain to my mother, not because she's 96, but because she's right. Why aren't they doing this now? So finally, I said, Mom, here's the deal. 
We're trying to create the cancer system that you think we already have. And most of you may think we already have, unless you have had cancer or you know someone with cancer, and you know <clears throat> that's not the system. So my Uncle Tom was a hoarder, and I mean massive hoarder, to the ceiling, every room in his house, over the toilet, over the tub, over the oven. I have no idea where he did his daily business, but he had stuff to the ceiling. So when he died, we started clearing it out. It took like a dozen city dumpsters. But as we went down, we found pretty cool stuff. We found my father's ticket home from World War II on the Queen Mary from London. We found the letter my grandfather wrote to every member of Congress during the Depression saying that we needed cotton subsidies to save the South. We found the answers to those letters. And the coup de grace was my father's World War II duffel bag with his Colt 45 and a bag of bullets on the floor of the house where he dropped it when he came home from the war and no one had moved it in 70 years. <laughs> Until my mother mailed it to me in a box <laughs> with the gun and the bullets in 2003. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. 2003, you could mail a Colt 45 and a bag of bullets through the mail in a box. I opened it up and went, oh, is there a ransom note in here? So why do I tell you that? Well, you're pretty clear that my Uncle Tom's crazy, right? He was born, lived, and died in that house. Well, so does your medical data. It's born and lives and dies where it was created, in a doctor's office, in a hospital, in a cancer center. When my uncle does that, we call it crazy. When Sloan Kettering does it, we call it policy. That's what we've got to change. So that's one of the things we're working on, and we're working with M-Code, and I know you're all familiar with M-Code, minimum cancer oncology, minimum common oncology data elements, because we need to speak the same language in cancer. All the other scientists look at cancer and go, man, you guys are the worst. Cardiology, since the Framingham study, has been common elements. Every other science, common elements. Cancer, no. It's like pianist. Some people are taught to play like this, some people are taught to play like this, and when you ask them why, they say, that's how my teachers, 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 teachers taught them. And that's how we do medicine today. Standards. We're giving all these people immunotherapy that can give them diabetes with their cancer, if it doesn't help their cancer, and we've never come up with a way to measure it. So we are working on an assay to measure the response to immunotherapy so that the FDA can tell one company versus another in the 1,400 trials going on right now in immunotherapy, how to measure success and how to measure when you should not give it to somebody because getting diabetes is a truly awful thing if you've already got cancer. So that's one of the things we're doing. Patient navigation. I went to Sloan Kettering for a year before I had a treatment to get checked. I went to this, I was like a you know, rabbit run. I knew exactly where to go. And then they said, you're starting chemotherapy. I said, when? They said, tomorrow. I said, tomorrow, tomorrow. He said, yeah, tomorrow. Now, I was running a company. I was going to go into the hospital for five days. How many people can just stop everything and go into the hospital for five days with 24 hours notice? I needed a navigator to have warned me about that. Then when I went to the chemo in a different wing of the hospital, I got lost. And then I sat there in my shorts and my T-shirt, and the nurse puts on a hazmat suit. She puts on a face mask. She puts on an apron and gloves. I thought, whoa, whoa, whoa. What about me? I'm in a <laughs> jeans and a, I mean shorts and a t-shirt. Well, if somebody had explained to me, they do this 30 times a day. If they spill a little every time, it's a bad thing. So they dress up. You don't have to. We're putting it in your blood. You're supposed to get it. So patient navigation, clinical trials. We've started something called the Oncology Clinical Trial Information Commons. You remember when the airlines first created Saber? So you could get a reservation on any flight and you didn't have to go where, airline by airline to find where they are. That's what, that's what this is. It's called Octic. We'll come up with a better one later. But the whole point is we need to be able to match people to trials and give them information about what's involved, how many needles you're going to get, how long it's going to be, what the side effects are going to be. None of that is made known to patients now. We wonder why they don't raise their hand to go in the trial. Right? I don't even fly without knowing where I'm going to sit, what they're going to serve, what movie I'm able to see. But when I go in the hospital, it's ole ole and free, good luck. We have got to change that. And access to care. I don't have time to go into it now, but you know, everybody's talking about the price of drugs. Okay, I get it. 
But even if you take a $300,000 drug and make it $100,000, the copay is still $5,000 for somebody making $30,000 a year. And they have to pay it, if they get diagnosed at Halloween, they have to pay the $5,000 by Christmas, and then in January. It's untenable. So before you get all excited about the political debate about the price of drugs, our proposal is no copays for cancer, and then no copays for anything when you have to have it. It's like insulin. The founders of insulin, the discoverers of insulin, got the Nobel Prize and they sold the patent for $1 to the University of Toronto. And the drug companies have now jacked it up to $300 to $400 a vial, something people have to have every day. This is untenable. So why do I say no copays for cancer? Why do we have copays? Because they want you not to take the brand name drug if there's a generic. They don't want to pay for your Viagra. They don't want to pay for your Lipitor if you can get a Torvastatin. How does that relate to cancer? You have maybe one choice. Maybe one choice. And too many people are choosing hospice over bankruptcy because those are the choices. You know what it would cost Medicare to forgive the copay for the people who are unsubsidized in Medicare who have to pay all of it out of their pocket? It would cost a billion dollars, which is 38 cents a month increase in premium for Medicare people. Isn't that a good trade-off? Isn't that a good trade-off? So when I say the system you think we have, most people think we've made a lot of progress against cancer, and we have. We could be doing so much more. We could be doing so much more. And if the progress we make is unaffordable for people because $5,000 is more than they have saved up, and they're making $30,000 a year, if they're white on Medicare, if they're black, it's $18,000 median income then we've got a problem because we're not getting things to the people. And that's where I want to come back to what you do. You know, you're doing an amazing thing. As Monica Bertinoli, the head of ASCO, told me yesterday, she said, you need to remember that M code is the language and fire is the voice. And I told her I was going to steal that. She said, please do. Fire is the voice. You are giving voice to information that can save lives. And that's why I'm in a hurry. I hope that you will join a couple things. One, we need to have everybody in the EHR go in and flip the damn switch to use M code so that we have common elements adopted now. When the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology, which has been there for 20 years, put out their last rulemaking about the APIs and, and making data available digitally as is required by law since the patients own it, they said, we should be able to do this in two years. No. At the Biden Cancer Initiative, we are recruiting cancer centers and hospitals right now to do something completely different. Which would you rather do? Design a system to respond to random requests in random ways, in random language from random people asking for their records, or design a system where you punch a button and you send the record by default the way you do your bank statement and your investment statement so that the moment a medical record is created, it is provided to the patient in a digital format, either to them or to their cloud address or to their doctor, whomever they want you to send it to. And now, and why do I think we're able to do that now? We bill the same people every month. We know where they are. We know how to find them. They don't know where, we, where the hospital is. They don't, I don't even know how to ask from Sloan Kettering for my records. If I called my doctor, he'd say I have no idea. Well, why are we putting the burden on the patient? Every medical system should, as a default, now start providing people their medical record digitally. And yes, it's true, because e-patient Dave asked me if it's true. When Judith Faulkner met with Biden and a bunch of other people in the White House before we left, she asked him, why do you even want your medical record? And I leaned way back, because he has a temper. And, I, and he said, none of your damn business. And that's the answer. None of your damn business. It's my record. I'm entitled to it. Make it easy for me to get. Codex, a fire accelerator for cancer. We need you to join up. We need your help. Because we, the more people who do it, the faster it will happen. And cancer, of most of the diseases, is the one where time is of the essence. A friend of mine just diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer in her 50s which can be a six-month diagnosis. 
had to wait a month for her insurance company to approve a scan. This is untenable. This is inhuman. And when we can't get the data out of a hospital to know what your deal is, when we have to wait four days to find out I have leukemia, when I could have had a blood clot on the airplane because I didn't know, that is unacceptable. That is unacceptable. Now, I'm a bad cellist. I know a good cellist, Yo-Yo Ma, because I worked for Al Gore, and Al Gore and Yo-Yo Ma were college roommates. So I got to meet Yo-Yo Ma, and we talk about cello. And I asked him one time, you know, what's the mistake everybody makes? Everybody says practice makes perfect. It doesn't. Practice makes permanent. Only perfect practice makes perfect. So you have to practice the hard parts more than the easy parts. You can't just play the piece over and over and over because the hard part's not getting any more attention. You need to play the hard parts because amateurs practice until they get it right. Professionals practice until they cannot get it wrong. You're professionals. What does it mean for you to practice until you cannot get it wrong? We have to reverse the presumption. For 20 years, we've been working on how to make the data accessible how to make it exportable, how to make it interoperable. We're asking the wrong question. I want you to practice creating systems that are not capable of hoarding data. Systems that are not capable of hoarding data. That's what we need. We need to make it impossible for people to hoard the data. Make it impossible for them to delay giving it to you. Make it impossible for it to cost so much that they say the patient has to pay hundreds of dollars. That's our challenge. And why am I unwilling to wait two years? In the last two years, I've lost three of my lifelong best friends to cancer. One of them had six months. One of them who lived here had three years. One of them lived with her breast cancer for a few years and then passed. Two years is an incredible number of lifetimes in cancer. That's why I don't want to wait for the appropriation cycle, the regulatory cycle, the development cycle at Epic and Cerner and everybody else. I want a sense of urgency so that patients know that they don't have to wait four days to find out they have leukemia and they don't have to wait months to get their medical records so they can get into a clinical trial. And you are the ones who have this in your hand more than I do. You speak the secret language that can go behind the wall and create a system that is incapable of hoarding data. And if we do that, not only will we all be really proud of ourselves, but you will meet people whose lives you have saved because a little bit of data can go a long way when you have cancer. Thank you so much for having me today.